Welcome to Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. This program is sponsored by some area churches of Christ and is dedicated to spreading the everlasting gospel as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. The churches of Christ accept the Scriptures as totally inspired of God and the all-sufficient guide for faith and practice. Therefore, they reject all doctrines of men and rely totally on the Bible to direct their course in serving God. It is our pledge to you that each lesson will be the truth as revealed in His Holy Word. Mr. Barnett carefully prepares the graphics so you can clearly see the book, chapter, and verse of each lesson taught. We urge you to either copy the scriptures used or record this program for further study. If you have any questions or comments, or if you need prayer, the Seeking the Lost ministry can be reached toll-free at 1-800-390-7734. It is our prayer that Seeking the Lost will be an important source of information about God's Word and will help you more perfectly worship Him. And now, here is Mr. Barnett. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to the Seeking the Lost broadcast. All of us, I'm sure, know this particular song that I'm using as a header today, My Country Tis of the Sweet Land of Liberty. I want, of us, I want us to study about our country today because all of us believe that it's in grave danger, not only from without, but from within. Let's talk about our country. The present situation, in 2008, a study showed that 92% of Americans believed in God or a universal spirit. Now, even the atheists thought about a universal spirit. However, let's look at it again. 72% of Americans think religion is losing influence in American life, up five points from 2010. Now think about that for a moment. We are talking about religion in the United States of America. We're talking about 92% of Americans believe in God, or in the case of some atheists, a universal spirit. But when you look at it again, 72% of Americans think that religion is losing influence in the United States. And you know, I, I tend to agree with that. And I think that if you look around, you'll see maybe examples of how that religion is more and more taking a back seat in the United States of America. 92% of Americans believe in God, then why are we being billed as a non-Christian nation? That's hard to fathom, really. But the present situation is, uh, shows signs of danger. Young Americans are abandoning God in droves. Now, you know, that should bring you out of your seat. What about our young Americans? They're talking about teenagers, maybe preteens. They say that they are abandoning God in droves. And this is a survey by the Pew Research Center. In other words, this is not somebody's guess. This is something that they have extensively studied finds that belief in the existence of God has dropped 15 points in the last five years among Americans 30 and under. They call this generation the millennials. In other words, those that were born before 2000, turn of the millennium. They dropped 15% in the last five years. And of course, we understand that that's very shocking. Pew, which has been studying the trend for 25 years. This is not somebody just grabbing something off the top of their heads. Finds that only 68% of the millennials, that's those that were born uh, 20 years up to 2000, 68% of millennials in 2012 agree with the statement, and this is the statement they ask, I never doubt the existence of God. What did I say? 68%. This is down from 76% in 2009 and 83% in 2007. What's this saying? It's saying that they answered in the negative of the question, I never doubt the existence of God. In other words, in 2007, about 83% would answer yes, I never, or no, I never do 
uh, doubt the existence of God. Well, you find that in 2009, just two years later, that had dropped to 76% of those answering favorably. And down in 2012, that's the latest that I have on it, only 68% of the millennials that they agree that they always, they never doubt the existence of God. A new survey shows that it dropped 15 points in the last five years among Americans 30 and under. Young Americans are abandoning God in droves. What is that going to tell us? What is, if that trend continues, what will it be? Well, we're going to reach that point in which that we could be referred to as an atheist nation instead of a Christian nation. Ask you a question. <clears throat> Are you proud to be an American? Most of you watching this television broadcast answers in the affirmative. Yes, I am proud to be an American. You remember that Lee Greenwood, that his song, I'm Proud to Be an American, that it was number one and is played so often in patriotic rallies even today. But let's look at this. Adult residents continue to say they are proud to be an American, including 57% who are extremely proud. I'm in that crowd, are you? And 28% who are very proud. <clears throat> However, according to a recent poll, only 40% of solid liberals say that they often feel proud to be an American. In other words, what are we talking about? It seems that it gets down, breaks down to a person's political ideology, that those that are solid liberals, that only 40% of them would say that I'm proud to be an American. On the other hand, we find that the conservative side, that the rates are much, much higher. It needs, we need to think about that. Why would anyone not be proud to be an American? whether he was extreme liberal or extreme conservative, there should be no question that he feels proud to be an American. I'll tell you what, go to the border and see the thousands of people that are trying to slip in here. We must have something here. We must, because all the world wants to come to America. Just think about that. Are you proud to be an American? What about American exceptionalism? What does that mean? That means that the United States of America stands above all other countries in the world. Do you believe that? I do. I've believed it all of my life, ever since I was just a boy, that the United States of America is the greatest country in the world. And in my humble opinion, that it was established by the providence of God for good in this world. But that's my opinion. A lot of people would disagree with that. But what about American exceptionalism? Do you believe that America is exceptional in comparison to all the world? I do. I'm sure that many of you watching does. But fewer than four in ten Americans say the United States stands above all other countries in the world. In other words, stand where I do, that it stands above all other countries in the world. A majority say it is just one of the greatest countries. Now you have to look at that language very carefully. What do you mean it's just one of the greatest? Well, it means that there are other countries that are just as great or may even be greater. I'd like someone to point that one out to me. But it says here that many people will say, well, the majority of people say, well, it's just one of the greatest. That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about American exceptionalism. Fewer than four in ten Americans, in other words, about 30 of say that the United States stands above all other countries in the world. Somebody said, well, what are you doing all this talking about? Uh, you're supposed to be preaching the gospel. Don't you worry, that's coming. And it all ties into what we're talking about right here. American exceptionalism. Do you believe it? Do you believe it's the greatest country that ever lived? I think it's the 
ever existed. Do you? I believe it's the greatest country that has ever existed since history began. That's the way I feel about it. But there's a lot of people that disagree with that idea. Let's look here. What about American history? You know, one of the things we have to be careful about is that people adopt a curriculum that downplays the idea that America is exceptional. Now, they're having a controversy now out in the Jefferson County Public Schools in Colorado. And I want you to think about this because more than likely you'll see this broadcast again. Sometimes we recycle them. And this is something that we seldom ever do, that is to date a broadcast. But it's going on right now, and it needs to be brought to all of our attention. There is a raging controversy in Jefferson County Public Schools in Colorado concerning the history of curriculum. Somebody said, why get excited about that? A proposed review of the advanced placement United States history curriculum, it's, a, it's abbreviated APUSH. You see that, advanced uh, placement United States history cause students and teachers to walk out of school and protest. Why are they out on the streets? Well, it's not because of what you might think. You see, here is something that has infiltrated even our educational system. Uh, this person wanted a review, wanted a committee to review what's being taught in our history classes. Well, let's go a little further about that. Those calling for the review of a push states that it has an emphasis on race, on gender, on class, on ethnicity, ethnicity grievance, and American bashing, and simultaneously omitting the most basic and structural philosophical elements considered essential to the understanding of American history for generations. Now listen. There's no one, I don't think, that can say, I know I can't, that, you know, everything that's happened to us in history has been good. But we know that we have made mistakes. But that doesn't mean you have to write a curriculum that just emphasizes those mistakes and doesn't show about the good. I'm told in these, uh, this particular uh, curriculum that such people as George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and others just barely get a line in there. What's going on? Well, it's the idea of the thinking of many in America that, you know, America's just bad. Don't you ever believe that? But anyhow, this is what it was all about. And it's still raging. As I say, you may see this sometime in the future, and this will have already been resolved. But I think it's good that we look at what's happening right now today. The proposal, proposal submitted to the board suggested the committee would make sure that the United States history materials promote citizenship. I'm for that. Patriotism, essentials and benefits of the free enterprise system. Well, there are people today that says, no, you know, the capitalistic system is just wrong. It needs to be, what are you going to replace it with? Just think about that now. Respect for authority and respect for individual rights. That's what I want my grandchildren taught. Instructional materials should present positive aspects of the United States and its heritage. Doesn't say you can't mention some things that we're not very proud of, but just bash the United States and also content pertaining to political and social movements and the United States history should present balance and factual treatments of those positions, not just saying, you know, the United States is a bad place, bad place. You know, this is a very dangerous trend, something to think about. And so the Advanced Placement United States History Curriculum, abbreviated APUSH, it's administered by the college board. And you may have heard about that, the same group that runs the SAT test. 
the new curriculum summarized in a framework document became effective in fall of 2014. Hundreds of other documents posted by the College Board delved deeper into each area of the curriculum. And it's raging more than just in Colorado because in Texas, the State Board of Education is considering ditching the whole course altogether. Why? Because it doesn't give the true picture of the history of the United States of America, which I believe excels in exceptionalism. <clears throat> Present situation today, why do people hate us? The most benevolent country that's ever been. When you have an earthquake, total devastation of other countries, who's the first one there and who gives the most? That's the United States. When people are oppressed, when people are being maliciously killed, who comes to the rescue? Well, it's the United States. American enemies today, all of you have heard about ISIS. The spokesman has called on the group's foreign fighters to attack the United States and its allies. Of course, you know that when things like that happen, they, uh, they usually receive retaliation. But they hate us. They look upon us as a great Satan. Iraqi Prime Minister says Islamic State plans subway attacks in the United States and Paris. That's September 20, 2014, just recently. And of course, as I say, it may turn out that later that uh, you know this proved to be true or not true. And this somewhat dates this broadcast, but I'm just saying that American enemies today, they're determined to destroy the United States of America. The ISIS threat, this terror group is systematically beheading children in Iraq. They are killing every Christian they see, says a Chaldean leader. Kill every Christian. You know, in my lifetime, I never dreamed that the world situation would get thus. I'm sure that Christians have been killed all, the, all through the years. Now here's an example and something that I can't understand. This is a British woman, Sally Jones. She's age 40. She converted to Islam and has joined the ISIS forces in Syria and called for the beheading of Christians on social media and Twitter. She said, you Christians all need beheading with a nice blunt knife and stuck on the railings at Raga. And she says, come here and I'll do it for you. What kind of world is this? That a British citizen? Hey, they're not exempt. There are even American citizens joining ISIS. How could that be? How could it be that someone would hate the United States of America, the most exceptional nation ever existed, and they want to go to someone that wants to destroy it? I don't understand those things. But anyway, we know this happening. You remember what John, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy said, President Kennedy, ask not what your country can do for you, but what can I do for my country? All right, Christians, let's think about it. What can you do for your country? You remember, you remember the song that kids sing in Bible studies and in vacation Bible schools? I may never fly over the enemy. I may never shoot the artillery. I may never march with the infantry, but I am in the Lord's army. That simple little song is something that we've got to consider and to think about as Christians facing the dangerous world that we are. Look at Romans 13. You don't think God Almighty is involved in the affairs of the world? Let every soul be subject to the governed authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Somebody says, what does that mean? Does that mean that he has appointed ISIS to govern the world? No. But he has said that man is to live under civil authority. What people choose 
is of their own choosing. We have chosen to be a republic and to have a democracy here. Therefore, whosoever resisteth the authority resists the ordinance of God. What I'm saying is he has chosen that man will be ruled by civil authority. For rulers are not a terror to do good works, but to evil. That is the true civil authority. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do that which is good, and you'll have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good, not for evil. And so, you know, evil regimes usually has an uprising because they're not doing what God expects a civil government to do. But if you do evil, in other words, if you get out and commit crimes, be afraid. He does not bear the sword in vain. He is God's minister. Who is? Well, those in civil authority. An avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. That's what our country's done, to execute judgment upon those who are practicing evil who have taken away that which God expects a civil leader to do, and that is to allow his subjects to live peaceably. And so it's our duty to obey the law. But it's not saying that we have to endorse evil. Now look, Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Jesus said, we're talking about duties of the a Christian duty to the nation, they were trying to entrap him. Tell us, where, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? This was a loaded question because the Jews hated paying tribute to Caesar. If he said, yes, it's lawful, then the Jews would jump up and say, they don't represent me. If he said it is not lawful, then the Roman authorities would be told that he is an insurrectionist. Their motive was very bad. Jesus perceived their wickedness. Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said, Whose image is in the inscription is this? And they said, Well, it's Caesar's. And he said, Will you render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's? You see, they tried to entrap him, but they couldn't. They couldn't cross swords with the Lord Jesus Christ and really come out on top. Totally disarmed them. They were amazed at him, went on the way and left him alone. But here we look and we see that we render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Our Christian duty is to do that in our civil, our dealings with the civil authority if, if they let us live in peace and harmony. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks should be made to all men, for kings and all who are in authority. If he could ask them to pray for kings, those ruling the Roman Empire, living under the suppression of the Roman eagle, just think how much more that we can pray for our American leaders as we live under the authority of the American eagle, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, the perfect state that we find ourselves in in the United States. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He is saying that we can pray for kings and all who are in authority, Surely we can pray for our own United States of America. Let's think about this. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. You know, we're in a desperate struggle. We are in the battle of Armageddon right now. Somebody say, oh, that's going to come in some time in the future. You're missing the fight. The struggle between good and evil is going on in the world right now right now. And if you're waiting for some future invitation to join a fight of the Battle of Armageddon, you're missing, the, you're missing it. Why? 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's not a pistol. It's not a rifle. It's not a warplane. It's a cannon. What is he talking about? Fighting evil, physical evil of other nations, this world has all of these things. But he says, our weapons are not but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Dealing with the mind of men and women. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. What is it now? We are in a spiritual war. We are in a death life and death struggle for the souls of men and women and boys and girls. Now you look at the world, it seems as if we're losing because Satan, I'm sure that he gleefully enjoys all of the killing of Christians across the world. Well, you and I, as a person, can't do much about that, can we? But what can we do? Well, we can fight the good fight of faith we can pray. Did you know that prayer is so important and it's so powerful and we can preach the gospel because it's the power of God and the salvation and we can win the war, so to speak. We can pull down the strongholds of Satan. We can cast down all the arguments. We can cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience. We are in a horrific battle right now. And many people are missing it. Paul said, For we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age. You can see it, can't you? Against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Well, we're going to lose this battle. We're not big enough to win. Don't you believe it? Because you see, God has given us something that we can win with. Take therefore upon you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil and having done all to stand. What is it now? The armor of God, the helmet of salvation. Just think about it. The sword of the Spirit. What is this sword? It is the word of God. We pray. We can pray. We can fight with the weapons that we have. This is what we owe ourselves, our families, and our country. Our God is an awesome God. You have been watching Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. If you need prayer or have comments or questions, feel free to call the Seeking the Lost ministry at 1-800-390-7734. That's toll-free, 1-800-390-7734. Seeking the Lost is sponsored each week by some area churches of Christ. Until next time, may the good Lord bless you and keep you.